now it's time to uh, take a little trip. We're going to go across the Atlantic. The year was 2005. My understanding is that this day in London is referred to as 7-7. That would be July 7th. It was the morning rush hour on the London subway. And suddenly, life for scores of people changed in a flash. Here to talk about this day is David Whitmore, who is the senior clinical advisor for the medical director of the London Ambulance Service, NH Trust, NHS Trust, excuse me. David has a wide range of operational experience which sadly covers many terrorist incidents, rail disasters, and civil disturbances. David, though, has seen his profession strengthen through the lessons they have learned from these tragedies. He is a member, a board member, of the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care, the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. David, thank you. We certainly get the award for traveling the greatest distance. I just have one thought, though, David. Is it true that you accepted this invitation because you knew the royal wedding was taking place tomorrow and the idea of getting out of London was actually averting your own disaster? So, David, thanks again for coming. Come on up and let's hear your story. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I appreciate I'm not a US citizen, but can I plead the Fifth Amendment on that last question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my thanks to being invited here today to speak um, about this incident. Um, what I would like to do before I actually get into my presentation is can I please thank um, everyone in the United States that sent messages of support to both London and the London Ambulance Service following these, these events. Um, we have no way of, of returning those thanks other than when we do get these sorts of presentations it's just to say a general thank you. Uh, my thanks go to the, to the United States for those who did send us those messages of support. They were greatly, greatly um, uh, received. I am by profession a paramedic. I've been working for the ambulance service now for about 32 years, so I think I'm probably going to stay. Um, I'll probably retire in, in, in harness. My talk will cover very briefly, just a very brief overview of the London Ambulance Service itself. I'll refer to it as the LAS. My apologies. Um, like most EMS people, uh, acronyms are, are our way of life. I'll give a very brief overview of, of incidents in London since uh, 1980 to 2005. Um, my personal account of what I was doing on the day, um, and my apologies, I'm trying to explain to you what was essentially actually four bomb sites, but actually on five different locations with patients at five different locations. I'm, I'm actually trying to explain five major incidents in one. So my apologies if it gets a little bit disjointed, I'm very happy to take questions afterwards. And then an overview of, of the LAS, um, how we approach major incidents. Who we are, we are the, we believe to be the busiest emergency service of its type, ambulance service of its type, which is totally fit the point of delivery. We're the only organisation that covers, health organisation, that covers the whole of London. And we are deemed to be the front line of the, of the NHS in the capital. We cover 383 uh, square miles. And to do this, we have 70 ambulance stations at our busiest times, um, about now in London, it'll be about 250 odd amps on the streets, 96 response cars, as you can see there, 10 motorbikes. We use push bikes a lot, and an increasing use of push bikes now. One helicopter, and 70, sorry, my apologies, 45 station pets, ranging from cats to animals. I really don't know how to describe them. <laughs> we, look, we look after a population in 2005, it was a population of two, two and a half million people is now about 8 million people, and then with tourism and commuter traffic, etc., we're looking look after about eight, 8 million people. We take roughly, roughly, 3,500 to 4,000 999, 911 calls a day. Um, so we are quite busy. A bit of history. These are some of the uh, major incidents that we dealt with. And uh, London, the only time we've ever had two bombings in one day, and I've left out of these slides all the minor bombings, um, was on, in July 1982 when the IRA bombed the uh, horse guards and then later on bombed a military band in Regent's Park. I attended both incidents. I'm just finishing cleaning up my ambulance after the Hyde Park bombing, which is on the bottom left of your screen there, when we heard the other bomb go off about a mile away 
and we were off yet again. In the 90s, we saw less terrorism. Um, and again, I'm afraid not, not all the bombings are on here. I've left out all the, some of the minor Middle Eastern bombings that occurred in London and some of the minor IRA terrorism that was occurring. Um, I'm going to talk about the Compton Street nail bomb, which is the middle one of the blue there, in a moment, to demonstrate how we actually um, deal with major incidents and how we devolve some of our decisions down to our, down to our paramedic staff on the road. As you can see, though, this is the slide um, where we had the 7-7 attacks. But as you can see from these slides, and these slides are in the pack, other incidents going on throughout these other years, and sadly, which most of which I, I attended in one role, form or another. It would be very naive of me, ladies and gentlemen, to say that everything went well on that day. It didn't. We, we, we were stretched. I make no apologies for that. We were at absolute capacity, all of us, from the, our most junior member of staff to people like myself who were really, really stretched. And I actually should not have been in London that day, or at my office, my apologies. But I'll come on to what I was doing and why I was where I was later on. Communications failed very, very quickly. We had hundreds upon th hundreds of thousands of people using mobile phones, and the mobile phone system just, just fell over. Um, we have now banned, literally banned, anyone from using a mobile phone at an incident. You will use your airwave radio, which we can now track. We can track you through our digital radios now. We know where you are. Medical logistical support, we had immense difficulty getting uh, supplies and, and, and backup drugs, etc. all these sites. London is an ancient city. It predates Roman times. The streets, A, are not paved with gold, but also they're quite narrow in, in places, and movement of traffic was an absolute nightmare. And if you suddenly pour hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets, you are gridlocked instantly, and that caused us a lot of problems. We have taken some criticism for managing the incident in as much as those who survived and were uninjured as such, they were in the carriages or on the bus, but weren't physically, and I, I, I choose my words carefully, they weren't physically injured, but they obviously were involved and, and psychologically injured, felt that they were to an extent um, ignored, not cared for as well as maybe they felt they should have been. We have to take this job, this on, this on board, the involved and injured. Triage, triage has now received intense legal scrutiny in the United Kingdom. We've been through the mayor's, um, mayor's, uh, mayor's inquiry in 2006, and we are still going through Her Majesty's coroner's inquest, and that verdict is due to be given on the 6th of May, uh, so next week. And triage, again, I will talk about triage, but we were, we were crit we, wrong, criticised the wrong word, we were quizzed deeply by the legal teams of the survivors around triage. And incident training and exercise, you've heard so much about that today, um, I'm afraid you'll hear a bit more from me. We do have one plan in London. It's a quite a small document. It's only about 60 pages long, but every single blue light service, plus the Coast Guard, um, HM Customs and Excise, etc., have all signed up to this plan. And it does detail um, how each service should respond, what they're responsible for, etc. So we do know what each person should be doing. Now, without this plan, we would have been completely and utterly stuffed. Now, this, this has been in existence now for several, I'm talking about probably 20-odd years or so. Um, and, but everyone, and I mean everyone, must know about this, be you a paramedic on the streets or be you a hospital administrator. You need to know about this plan. And if you have similar plans in your, own, in your own systems, it is worth just asking the question of all your staff, do you really know of the plan? Do you understand it? And I think with us, we, we have a staff turnover roughly... 50% of our staff will leave in a five-year cycle. So, again, you have to keep reiterating the, these, these lessons. In the UK, we operate a very basic command structure to begin with, gold, strategic, silver, tactical, bronze, operational. I, I'm assuming it's fairly um, common to, to most systems or something like this. And we take the view that initially this is role, not rank, because, as I'll come on to, to talk about, your first people on scene are not often people like myself or the, or the, the, the chiefs, etc. It is your, your frontline staff, your paramedic, your EMT, etc. So I'll use this one instance here. This was the scene immediately, about five minutes or so after the uh, bombing in, in central London. This was by a right-wing activist. He was just out to kill people. He had no particular uh, political affiliations. Our first response was a motorcycle paramedic. He was there within about five minutes or so. So this is what he was actually facing. He took on the silver roll. He got everything organised. 
And as more managers, and more, I, I turned up approximately uh, 50 minutes into the incident, I let him carry on as silver. He had the plans in his head, he was doing a good job. I felt it was, it was much better for me to let him carry on. I would support him and give, give him some leadership. And I let him carry on with this. I was very prepared to step in if I had to. I think that's, that's that fine balance your senior managers have got to be prepared to take. But in my view, frontline staff, they get there first. You want to train them, you must trust them, you must trust them, because they will do a good job for you, and then lead them as and when you, you need to. Every member of staff in the LAS is carrying these action cards, and I've, I've still got uh, the ones I used on 7-7. On, on They're very simple, they just literally detail what you should be doing if you're first on the scene, if you're bronze triage, if you're bronze parking, if you're silver medic, etc. Um, so you can just, they're an aid memoir, that's all they are there, you just take the right card out, bring it to the front and get on with the job. We used a triage card system which will be familiar to a lot of people here, um, this is the ones we, again we were using, and we used a large number of these. I think in my pack I've actually said 500 will be used, I'm not quite so sure about that figure, but certainly many, many hundreds. One of the problems we had though was, um, that a lot of these cards were removed on admission to hospital, to the EDs, and therefore, some of these cards have just disappeared into the ether. And when we are being quizzed six years down the line by the coroners, um, trying to back up and remember your decisions is very difficult. There is a message there. We also, every duty station officer vehicle carries a series of grab packs, 10 for their various designated roles at a major incident. And all they have is the action, an action card for that role, a tabard for that role, some paperwork for that role, that's it. So if you turn up and you have to, you, you have to take on Silver Medic, you're given the pack and you get on with it. Its system does work. It does work. Let's turn to the events now of the 7th of July. Well, the 6th of July was the event that we all really wanted to remember. The day we got the Olympics, I personally groaned because I knew my workload was just going to go straight through the roof. <laughs> and it still is going through the roof for the Olympics. But we will succeed. The Olympics is going to happen. OK. Many of you will have been to London, and I hope you have fond memories of it. But as I said, it's an old city. It, the streets are not straight, there's not a, there's not a grid pattern. Um, so, I'll take you through the four bomb sites, and I'm then going to come back to what I was doing. My apology seems a bit disjointed, but I think this is the best way to explain this. At 8.51, a phone call is received um, into the 999 system that something, and these were the words, something's happened at Allgate East Tube Station. We now know that it was a bomb. And this is a subsurface type subway system. Um, so the roof of the tunnel is about tw 12 to 20 feet in, at the most below, below um, street level. These are some of the larger subway trains. Um, and on this particular carriage, this is the fourth carriage uh, from the front of the train. Um, seven people were killed here and many, many, many scores injured straight out. I'll go through the instance first. I'll come back over them all. At 08.56... We receive a second um, call uh, to King's Cross Underground Station. This is a, also houses above it two mainline stations. The problem with this underground system, well, this particular line is, this is the deep subway system. So you're actually 20 something odd metres below ground level. This bomb went off in the front carriage, and this was where the greatest loss of life occurred, mainly because of the, the diameter of the, of the tube system there. You only have about a, a foot or so between the wall of the train and the wall of the tunnel. So a hugely, hugely contained blast. And that is where, why we had the greatest loss of life there. Again, I'll come back to this particular diagram. The third bomb went off at Edgware Road Station. Um, now, this particular bomb was on the front carriage of the train. As you look at this on the right-hand side, it was coming into the station... It would detonate as the other train was going out. So debris from the bomb went across the platforms and also killed and injured people on the, on the train going out. There was a tunnel, another tunnel, separate to, to, to this particular one here, where bricks and stuff were dislodged by the blast from the wall and injured people in, in, in another train. Thankfully, though, they were not badly injured. But it just shows the force. These were acetone peroxide bombs, so it's essentially this is high explosive about 10 pounds worth of high explosive being detonated at, in some places 90 feet underground. Absolutely terrifying if you are the person on those trains. When those bombs exploded, as we, and we now know, we now know that it all went off at the same time. 
0850 is the time they were actually detonated. Um, we now know the bombers actually made a pact at 0850, wherever you are, you set your bomb off. So, but the problem was the multitude of messages coming through the London Underground system, coming through the 999 system, etc., meant we were getting a very, very confused picture. Where were these bombs going off? And initially we didn't know there were bombs. We initially thought it was a blowout on the um, transformer system or the underground system. We had no idea to begin with these were bombings. But as we got crews on scene, it became very clear this was, this was bombing, this was terrorism. When those bombs exploded, 500 trains in the system. Each train can carry 2,000 people. Thankfully, we had some good fortune this day. Had these bombs gone off even maybe half an hour earlier, the rush hour would have been even greater. And f also, there would have been a lot more children involved, a lot more children involved. As it was, the youngest, the youngest person who died was, was 19. Um, so we had, if I can call it good fortune, there was some good there. The underground system decided to evacuate the entire London system, underground system, onto the streets of London. That was a big mistake. 200,000 people spilling out of, out of um, underground stations onto the streets of London just caused us even more problems. Um, a decision was made almost the next day. If this ever happened again, that would not be done. OK, just a bit of a recap. Within minutes of these bombs going off, the three bombs going off, we had many, many people dead and many, many further people injured, hundreds of people injured. Confusion was reigning, and I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm afraid that is, that is the truth. Confusion as to where these sites were, where were we going to be sending our resources, um, which exits and entrances, to, particularly King's Cross. There are 15 exits and entrances to King's Cross tube station. So we had to... Um, rely on the staff arriving to get this sorted out, get the information back to control our emergency operations centre. But very quickly, um, communications um, just, just fell over. So we had to rely on our local commanders on scene to get a grip of these incidents, get triage going, and, and sort these, these incidents out. The blue stars are for the calls we kept receiving. And again, I could, I could cover this map in blue stars. These are other reports of other devices and suspect packages, suspect cars, etc. that we kept receiving. Some of those we had to go and check out because what we were being told was that there has been another explosion at X location. That again further depleted some of our resources. So we had to deal with this going on as well. The command structure we eventually put in, got put in at all these sites. Um, again, this is the very simple gold, gold, silver, bronze. If you look at the last, the last but one line there, that shows you all the bronze officers at the five sites. Below those, replicate of each site is your bronze triage, loading, parking, etc. That equated to 60 managers and staff, and in total, we committed 200 ambulances. We only have about, then, only had about 250 anyway, and 420 staff were committed to this incident alone. And in about three hours, just under three hours, we actually moved 400 patients. But we're still getting calls all across London for the heart attack patient, the stroke patient. And as my colleagues have mentioned before, you cannot just abrogate your responsibility to the rest of the rest of area, in our case, the rest of London. So we had to still carry on with that. Now, we have a very well rehearsed system whereby we bring in other ambulance services from our surrounding counties. We also bring in St John and the, and the Red, British Red Cross. And we, we task those resources coming into London to look after our normal 999 work. We try not to send them to the incident sites because they, they don't know the hospitals, they don't, they don't know the areas. So we, we managed, we managed, but with a lot of, lot of um, backup from our colleagues right around the, the surrounding counties of London. This is our gold command here. They were trying to keep the rest of the service going. We were receiving about 50 patients an hour to deal with on top of all this. And that's approximately, in those days, about 50% of our normal demand. Um, we managed it. We managed it. And to this day, I, I sometimes wonder how we managed it. I think it is a testament to our staff and, and the hospitals and everybody that we just got on with the job. I'd like to now go back to, if I may, back to Russell Square and King's Cross. That day, I was actually due to be at a completely different location. I have a, another job with the um, regulatory body of paramedics in the United Kingdom. I got into my desk early that day just to get some emails covered and, you know, um, and go to the meeting at about 10 o'clock. About 5 to 9, a colleague of mine comes and he says, David, 
get down to the control room, something's happening, we're not quite sure what. So, okay, fine, not a problem. Um, what's my role in all this? Oh, you're Goldie, says. Okay, fair enough. I think as my colleague said earlier on here, you have that, oh my God, <laughs> moment. And if you don't, there is something wrong. There, and I, I agree with entirely, there is something wrong. Uh, I had more than an oh my God moment. <laughs> well, I walked into the control room and instantly picked up that we were just beginning by now, this is by now nine o'clock, we're just beginning to pick up an idea that this is actually a bomb on the underground system, which is our worst nightmare. It really is. I was then actually tasked to go to the scene to try to, um, to, to, take, to take a role there. I could not get there within literally one mile of leaving our headquarters, which is at Waterloo, so it's some three miles or so from the scene. I was already in, snarled up in traffic. I just could not get through the traffic. Just could not get through. I've tried to get back into, to, uh, on the radio to headquarters and say, look, I'm sorry, I can't get to this site. Um, and I'll, I'll start walking, running, whatever, but I'll, I'll get there. No, I will get there. I struggled on for another five minutes or so, and the Metropolitan Police Traffic Division did a fantastic job of literally pushing people off the roads, onto the side, and they were saying, shut your car down, turn the car off, and you know, leave it up on the pavement if you have to. But even with that, we still, I still could not get through to Allgate East. I'm beginning to hear all the messages coming over the radio system from our crews there, so look, I've got, this is an explosion, we've got many, many people dead, many, many people injured. Major incident was declared, and in, in the United Kingdom, anyone can declare a major incident. If you feel that your resources um, are out, uh, sorry, your demand out to resources, you call up, you just call up. I then heard, um, after about another 10 minutes of just desperate struggling to get through this traffic, I'm going to have to get out of my car and just run to Allgate East. I'm a relatively fit person, but I wasn't relishing that particular run, but I would, I would do it if I had to. I heard a colleague of mine say, um, I'm at Russell Square, I'm receiving casualties into the ticket hall, um, I need ambulances, I need help. Um, he said, I'm on my own at the moment. Oh, Christ almighty, okay. Eventually managed to get hold of someone in control to say, look, have you got resources at Allgate East? If you have, I'm going to divert to Russell Square. Uh, very quickly, yes, uh, yes boss, Russell Square it is. Okay, so I went to Russell Square. Eventually get to Russell Square. As I've explained, this is a deep tube tunnel system. The majority of the fatalities were in this front carriage. The carriage was completely blown apart, absolutely just ripped apart. Um, and that is where the majority of, there were 26 people killed in that carriage and scores upon scores of people wounded with uh, blast injuries. I'm not going to describe them. I'm, you're all in the medical world. You can, you can, you can picture it. Traumatic amputations, serious head injuries, chest injuries, etc. Um, but the way out for these patients is 90 feet underground, back along a railway tunnel that is now filled with smoke. And also, as we now know, um, there were parts of the bomb itself, some of the explosive that hadn't gone off, was lying on the ground in little sort of globules. As we now know, if we'd trodden on that, the potential for it to blow your toes off was actually very, very real. We didn't know that at the time, and actually, thank God I didn't. <laughs> um, I, ignorance is bliss in that, in that particular instance. But these are some of the hazards which you just don't think about when you turn up to work you know, early to answer some emails and then go off to a, another meeting. OK, so the back of this train was pulled away, and very quick was realised we could get that train pulled away, we could get into these carriages much easier to get our patients out. This is the scene of the carriage. Now, this is taken several days after the recovery phase. So all the, all the um, bodies have now been removed. But at the time, if you look at the left-hand side of the screen there, you can see what looks like a blue cable uh, there. That's the tunnel wall. It's very clear. Now, the, the, the wall of the train was literally just shattered and blown apart. Um, and prior to this photograph being taken, you would, you would have been looking at twisted metal and everything else with patients trapped underneath it. It's dark. The lighting, has just, the lighting has failed. You have people trapped, dead, dying. Um, and our staff just went straight into those tunnels uh, and got on with their job. Um, I again go refer you back to my previous um, slide about the Soho bombing. I've got to trust my staff, do the right thing. And they did. I honestly can, 
can honestly say that everybody I came across with that on that day did the most superb job I've ever known them do, be they police officers, fire service, ambulance service, nurses, doctors, whoever, everyone pulled together. So we've now got um, this train down here. I'm up in the ticket office in Russell Square. I get there and my colleague is there and I walk into the ticket office and I'm s all I see is people lying on the floor, limbs off, groaning, moaning, chest injuries, etc. It really was a scene out of I, I don't know what film. Um, and I'm just thinking, I, I had another oh my god moment. Sadly, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm, I have seen bombings before. This is, this is my, probably my tenth terrorist bombing I've personally dealt with. Um, but I was shocked. Oh, Christ, what am I going to do now? Got hold of my colleague Bill. He was already doing the triage. He said, look, David, I don't know what's going on downstairs. Um, we've got no idea. People are coming up. We don't know what's going on down below. And this was a problem. Communications from, the pl from down below to back up top was just, was just gone. It just didn't exist. So I went down into the tunnels. Now, this actually, again, was taking him back towards King's Cross. And already the fire service was set up, uh, very powerful arc lighting. But the scene I faced, um, I actually came approached from, you're actually looking towards the front of the train here. So I approached from actually come, sort of walking into the picture. And all I saw was eventually, because at that point I walked down the tunnels, so I've walked about 450 metres down these tunnels. Uh, the smoke was down to about here. So you're having to sort of stoop down every so often to try and make sure you're going to walk into the tunnel walls, etc. And Jane said it this morning, first session, silence. It was very, very eerie. Because I could hear occasionally a cry or a shout or something down that tunnel. But all else I could hear was nothing. I also had a thought, these, are deep, these tunnels are Edwardian, the Victorian tunnels. Is this tunnel going to collapse on all of us? And then you have to have a think of, well, if it does... There's nothing I can do about it. If it's going to come down, it's going to come down. So get on with it, Whitmore. Just <laughs> get on with it. So I did, and so did all my colleagues. OK. This is the ticket hall at Russell Square. Some of you may have been to it. It's actually, again, it's an old, old uh, uh, subway system. This is the ticket hall. As I approached this, this was just full of injured people. We use the term P1, P2, P3, so your immediate uh, um, life, immediate casualties, etc. P3 is our walking category. We are always worried in London, particularly from our, our lessons from the IRA terrorism, is they were, they were not averse to letting us believe there was a second device planted somewhere to, to catch us all out and kill us. So we were very worried about secondary devices, and we did not know, I did not know at this particular time, is this IRA terrorism wasn't quite their, their MO, but we had no idea who the hell was doing this. And that's frightening. That's frightening. And also, bear in mind, I, I was aware of the Allgate East bomb. I was aware of this one. I was vaguely aware of something else going on in, at uh, Edgware Road. But whilst I'd been down underground, the bus bomb had blown up. So when I came back up top, some plans I had in my mind were completely null and void. Because 200 metres around the corner they'd blown up a bus, and my routes of access and egress for my vehicles was just denied to me. So I had that problem to think about um, as well. So you, it's quite a good exercise in, in command task this is. Um, so we've now got all these people in this ticket hall here. Several decisions that myself and my colleagues had to make. What are we going to do with this? Now, we had great difficulty getting information back to control to send me ambulance. What I needed now was ambulances and equipment. I was there dressed, not quite as I am now, but I had a fluorescent jacket on, etc., and a helmet. Um, but I needed vehicles, I needed equipment. We had some good fortune. Just around the corner was a specialist hospital, it's a, it's a neurosurgery hospital, and a, child, a children's hospital. They sent some doctors around from both hospitals straight away. Problem, most, most plans do say don't let other stray doctors and nurses if you don't know who they are. My problem was, I knew I had no ambulances coming to me. I didn't know where the hell they were coming from. I had no kit. So do I send these nurses and doctors away? Uh, no, you don't. I didn't. Um, I am an ex-military policeman, so I can at times be fairly forceful. So I said, right, docs, over here. Nurses, over here, please. We went to the back, this back corner here, uh, over here, and said, right, these are the rules of the game now. You're working under my command. 
I want to know who of you are anaesthetists, who of you are critical care nurses? And the hands were said, right, fine. Consultant, nurse, team up, go to Bill, you'll be, you'll be assigned patients to look after. I then asked, have you got any general surgeons here? Cut the hands off, fine, okay, can you please go next door? We, tent, we sent all the P3 patients, the walking wounded, next door. I needed them to be re-triaged because adrenaline is a very, very good painkiller. So if you've sent a whole lot of walking wounded away to one place, if you don't re-triage them, you could end up with several people on the floor as either P2s or P1s, and it would be your fault. So I got the, the general surgeons next door to go and to do that for me. And that's how I worked it. That's how I worked it. Equipment came from the hospital. I had to use that to begin with. Now, we were actually on our own with these patients for nearly 45 minutes. It's been acknowledged that uh, this, was, this was a problem and a mistake. What happened was, as crews that were being sent to us came up the road, which is to the... My apologies. Came up the road, which is to, over that, that side, as you look at the right-hand side, they were seeing the bus that had blown up. That was at Tavistock Square. Tavistock Square, Russell Square. So some of the crews went to the wrong location to begin with. That is not their fault. As they came up the road, they were looking at a bus that's been blown apart and people shouting and screaming, come here, come here, help me, help me, etc. I cannot criticise them. Um, if, you get, if you get into the blame game with this sort of thing, you lose the trust of your staff. We have a system whereby you must document your decisions. Now, my original decisions were handwritten. I, I um, sympathise with Jane and her paper towels. Um, I was using some... Um, some some sort of ticket requisition paper from the ticket order. I wrote my decisions on that. When I got back, back to my office that, about 10 o'clock that night, I typed them up. They're all typed up, and, and they're now somewhere in the evidence bundles, as are the handwritten notes. And this is another lesson for people. If you make decisions and write decisions down, that's evidence. In the United Kingdom, I, I can only assume it's the same in this country. That's evidence that shows of what was going through your mind when you make these decisions. So what you write down uh, becomes evidence. This is now in the evidence bundles and the inquests and will stay there. Um, at event. This one regards um, what to do about the number of people in, I've got in Booking Hall. Use Tesco's next door, use not, and I use another building. My rationale is there. These are in my, in my pack as well. This is the one regarding what we had, we had a problem now. All these doctors and nurses were there. We kept saying to me, just, get, just let's move these patients, David. Let's move them. I said, well, I've got no trolley beds. I've got no ambulances. How am I going to do it? Not a problem. We'll get trolley beds from the hospital. And I'm saying, no, no, careful of this. This is a terrorist incident. We don't know if, there's other, if there are other um, devices around. And actually, after about... I'd been there for about 30 minutes. I was approached by an armed anti-terrorist officer... Uh, my apologies. Just out of shot here was a blue van. And they said, we strongly suspect, we have very good uh, intelligence, that might be a bomb in there. We need you to move your patients. So I'm very sorry, that is not going to happen. These are people with missing limbs. They are already hemodynamically compromised. And where am I going to take them? I've got nowhere to take these people. Uh, this, this was overheard by some of these doctors and nurses and I had a couple of other staff had arrived, and they looked at me and went, what are you going to do, David? <laughs> so, you know, that's me, that's leadership. And said, well, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, we are staying here. So if we move these patients out into the streets, we're either going to kill them because we've moved them and they're just, they are so desperately injured. So I'm afraid we stay here. We try and move to the back of the, the ticket off we can, but we're going to have to stay where we are. Thankfully, the, the device turned out to be... Um, a, some telephone directories with some wire that were just underneath them, thank God. But uh, I certainly had a slightly pale moment. That actually is the blue, the blue van I refer to, is just there, you can just see it. This is the scene as I suddenly, as I at long last get ambulances, I at long last get ambulances, and very quickly we cleared the scene. Um, we managed to, a lot of vehicles turned up, triage system worked very well, all the P1s went, Peter, and off we went. We now deploy, in the, before this event, we would wait for the first people on scene to say, I need five ambulances, ten ambulances, six ambulances, whatever they needed. We don't do that anymore. We, within one day of this incident, we instigated these pre-deployment, predetermined attendances, very much like the fire service do, but bear in mind in the United Kingdom, the ambulance service and the fire service are completely separate. 
We're funded separately, we train separately. And I do think that's probably a mistake on our part. To any explosion, we will send in see, six vehicles, six officers. Um, even if we just have a, a suspicion this might, this might be an explosion, train accident, etc. If someone says this is a major incident, you will get instantly um, 20 vehicles, 10 officers, all the available mass casualty equipment vehicles. Getting equipment to these sites was just horrendous on that day because of, because of, because of the, um, uh, the congestion, absolutely horrendous. I had no, very little morphine on site, very little. But what did happen was a little a, a, a lady turned up, very well dressed, with a Tesco's bag and a Sainsbury's bag, so that's the equivalent of a sort of Walmart bag and a sort of Costco bag, and she said, this bag's got uh, morphine in it, this bag's full of ketamine, where shall I leave it? <laughs> no, 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 no. I said, you don't leave it at all, madam. I said, who are you? I'm the pharmacist from, from X Hospital. I said, fine. You stay here with me. <laughs> I said to the doctors, we've now got analgesia here. But I made the decision, I said, look, I'm really sorry, we are going to stick with morphine, because that's what we all know we can use. Um, I, I wasn't sure what strength of ketamine she had. The analgesic dose, the anaesthetic dose, that's dodgy. So I said, well, you'll use the morphine only. And that's what we did. Okay, we also have this, in red here, this merit team. This is a new, a new thing we've instigated of previously HEMS uh, uh, um, paramedic, so who've worked on the, heli on the helicopter, etc used to major trauma, we now have these people, they'll carry out their own pages and we will, we will page them wherever they are in London at the time of any major incident, we get them into the scene as well. And we will always send, and we always used to send, liaison officers to every single hospital that we thought we were going to be using, because that is very important. My apologies if I'm rattling through this. That's one of our mass casualty vehicles. We now have uh, three of these uh, dotted at various locations around London. Each one of these vehicles can now deal with 1,000 patients. That's my apologies. My apologies. My apologies. 300 patients. Sorry, not that many. 300 patients. Just one vehicle. I'd like to turn to triage now, if I may. As I said, this is the first time it's been subject to such intense legal scrutiny in the United Kingdom. I was being asked about decisions I made six years ago for patients I can't remember. Now, bearing in mind patient identification... A huge number of these patients had their clothes blown off them. We had no idea. That there was no coat pocket. You know, jackets, you can, you, know, you can imagine an explosion in a tube tunnel. Jackets are blown off. Clothing is blown off. You're faced with a majority of people who have shreds of clothing on. So you've got no idea who these people are. They just become a male, a female. It's harsh. It's horrible. It's the aspect of treasure I, I hate personally. I hate, but you've just got to accept it. This good lady, Jill Hicks, she was one of many, many, many success stories, but very, very, very personal to myself. She actually has uh, no legs. She's, both her legs were, were blown off. She was the last person to be taken from the front of that carriage and carried by two police officers the 450 metres down that tunnel um, through the smoke and everything else. They, they carried her down there. She was brought up um, on the lifts and she was placed in front of me for a triage decision. Very much like a, a patient who was, who was described as earlier on, she was literally on the verge of death. I could have gone one way or the other because literally was this, was this an expected death but I was, and I'll be, my apologies for swearing, I was so bloody angry by now for what had happened and I was so frustrated I couldn't move my patients. Uh, I said, this patient is, you know, no one's going to die in this, in this ticket hall. They're really brave words to say, but I was just frustrated, angry. Um, I couldn't do what I wanted, what I would normally do for my patients. Um, and I made the decision, um, as I had enough people there, we will do everything for this lady. I said to the two doctors, to a doctor and a nurse, she's P1, deal with her. And they said, but she's about to cardiac, go into cardiac arrest. I said, she's P1, deal with her. Please. <laughs> and I re-triaged her several times uh, before vehicles got to me. Um, and I kept saying that she's P1. We've got to hang on. We've got to hang on to this lady. Um, now, the, the EMS person, the people in the audience will, will sympathise with this. Very often, my patients that I send to hospital from a major incident, I never know what happens to them. They go into the back of a vehicle, I drop them to the hospital, and sometimes I never know what happens to them. Several months later... My apologies, I've actually skipped a slide there. Um, several months later, I saw a, an article in the paper that said this lady, I now knew her name, 
was just about to walk down the aisle. I thought, she looks very, very, vaguely, vaguely familiar. And I actually coloured her in with a pencil. Because when I first saw her, she was covered in bomb debris, dust, soot, smoke, very few clothing, almost no clothing on. And I'm sure that's her. I phoned the, hospital, the um, newspaper concerned to say, is this lady um, from Russell Square, she is, can you please give her my best wishes for her life? And I literally gave me palpitations. I, I, I was just blown away by it. I actually cried, and my, my wife, uh, when the earth was going on, there were two daughters who at that time were fairly young. It really did, did choke me up. These are her own words. I would, if you get a chance, uh, read her book. It's her account of how we performed and how your good selves performed. And she has nothing but praise for everybody. Whatever discipline you are, administration, paramedic, doctor, etc. These are her words. She heard the two words, best words that you ever hear. P1, priority one. And a tag of some sort was placed on me. That sounded fantastic. She had no idea what P1 meant. Um, but she felt this was something that this was priority one. So for her, as a patient, someone was looking after her. And then one man held my hand. That we now know is the police officer, one of the two police officers. He didn't let go, and they didn't. They stayed with her, and they carried her all the way down the, the, the tunnel up to the top and handed her over to myself. We now we were, we were, had to answer some quite fierce questions in court around how do we do triage. We couldn't evidence some of our decisions um, because the, the tags had gone missing, etc., etc. We were also asked, when were you last trained in triage? Can you please show us your training records? So again, you need to think back to your training records. Can you prove to the powers that be? Or, to, to me, more importantly, I'm not too fussed about the lawyers. Um, they, they sit with the press in terms of my sort of uh, approbation. Um, but it's the patients, it's the relatives, it's those patients' relatives. When they've got the questions, they want to know the answers. Can we, can we answer their questions as to how was I trained? Am I, am I the right person to be in that situation? I believe I am, but you may have to prove it to somebody. So we now insist that it's done as a team of two, and we have, we have, we have two different triage offices going on. As, the, as we saw from the previous presentation, the very, what we call this, the hot triage sieve, are you walking, dead, or can't you, or you have to be carried? Get them, get them back to a county clearing station, get them re-triaged, uh, and then get them out of there. My apology if I'm, if I'm rushing through this. If I'm over my time, can someone please shout at me? Yeah, you're good. You're good. Please, please do. So you must evidence these decisions. You've got to justify your decisions. And these are your staff's decisions. And you've got to, you, know, you have to back your staff up. They're making decisions. If you go back to these, these trains, or, and indeed the bus, they're making them in the midst of smoke, wreckage, you know, um, other people dying around them, etc. These are difficult decisions to make. If you've never done it, my personal view would be, and I, I, this is not aimed at your good selves, this is aimed more at the bloody lawyers and some of the press. If you've never done it before yourself, don't be too quick to criticise those decisions because it, these, are, these are monumental decisions to make. We're often asking our junior staff to make them. As I said before, can you, can you prove formal education? We had some good fortune. We had our HEMS teams were having a clinical governance day. They actually were only about one and a half miles from Allgate East Tube Station. So they, they were able to send staff down there very quick, which is why Allgate East was very well supported to begin with. They also sent teams elsewhere across London. But getting to those places was an absolute nightmare. And in, in the United Kingdom, the minute we know it's a terrorist incident, we put an air exclusion zone in. We are, we are very worried about Trojan horses in, in, in forms of other, other aircraft, etc., particularly since 9-11. So the, air, the helicopter was not flying to the scenes, but it was able to fly to other parks, land, and get people in that way. We had 100 senior managers, all in one place in South London. That is partly good fortune. The other problem, though, was we couldn't then get them from there back into central London because of, because of gridlock. So some sort of good fortune, but did cause us some problems. The bus that blew up was right outside the British Medical Association. This is an administrative building. Um, I don't know what the United, the United States equivalent would be, but this is um, really a sort of professional body for the medical, for, the, for doctors. There was a group of doctors in there who were having a meeting. They instantly turned the place into a sort of field hospital. But again, it's an administrative building. It's never been thought of ever being used as a field hospital. 
So they had, again, very, very limited equipment. I think it again comes down to the way I was working. I had basically my hands, my eyes, my knowledge to begin with, and so do these good doctors here. And very often, if you've got the basics right, the real, ba I mean the real basics right, you are still going to save lives. We now have two new incident control rooms. The previous room was about half the size of this one. We now have a secondary control room, which is probably about half the size of this room, I should think, where we can completely mirror our Waterloo control if we have to. We have two other control rooms like this, uh, where we can run, if we have to, two different incidents from. We now would have our silver commanders in these rooms here, rather than close to scene. We're now using uh, airwave radios. We are confident, touch wood, that communications would not be so much of a problem. But, but, my view is you must always assume comms are going to fail. So use runners. We, got, we, we now specifically say to our motorbike paramedics and our cycle paramedics, you could well be used as runners in major incidents. These guys on the left of the screen, the cyclists, they are as fit as fiddles. They really, I mean, they are you know, incredibly fit people. Um, we use them a lot in Heathrow Airport, just as, out of interest. We will appoint straight away someone to look after those, the P3, so they get information. They, they, we were criticised by this group of people that we weren't looking after them enough. My, my personal view is you've, um, I had other things on my mind, uh, I, but I did make sure they were, they were OK. Comms, we had overload, just everything, just so many messages coming down the system from the police, the fire service, underground system, the cabinet office, um, our own staff trying to get through, etc., etc. We had uh, multiple command teams out, etc. We will now put command, silver command in a remote location and deal with it from there. And we exercise that now regularly. A lot of critical messages were missed. So we now have a critical instant logist. And their job, and there's often two or three of them, their job is just to look through and listen to the messages coming through and say that's critical and make sure it gets dealt with. Make sure these things don't get missed out. Mobile phones are banned. If I'm seen using a mobile phone as an incident, I'll probably get shot these days. Um, these are evidence. Your communication devices, we now use these airwave radios, they're, they're digital radios, they are taped. So everything I say down that mobile phone is taped. Even if I say, my God, get me help, uh, everything is taped. But also they track me. So uh, talking, our previous speaker was talking about they, you could track a vehicle, but not the staff. We now have the ability to track staff, as long as they're above ground. So again, bear in mind, this was underground, some of these incidents, so it's not always perfect. I've talked about I won't. I'll just quickly run through some of these. I've talked a little bit about this. How can you evidence that I'm fit for my role, or the people in this room are fit for the roles you undertake? This came under intense scrutiny, and I just put that out there. You need to exercise again, again, again and again. Make it real and stretch people. Now think of the unthinkable. I sympathise greatly with, with, my, with, with John here about being asked, have you, did you exercise for a bridge collapse? Well, no. Um, we are now, we are stretching our, 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 our management teams and our staff. We ran an incident recently where actually, we actually, we actually in, the, in the exercise, we actually killed some of our staff, because that was often overlooked. We're looking, at a, we're looking at a terrorist incident, like the Mumbai style type thing, and we said, okay, the first crews that arrived are shot to death, because that will really, really, really test you. So we think the unthinkable. You've got to exercise these sorts of things. Do you? I mean, this is, these are UK um, you know, mountain rescue, uh, fire police, ambulance, etc. What can they do for you in, in, in these odd situations? Um, I'm actually part of the Mountain Rescue Team as well. I live 150 miles to the north of London in the Peak District. Um, so you know, I have other skills which maybe I can bring to the party. But also, do I know enough of how you work? Have you, in your exercises, are you going to test, are you really going to stretch me and test me? Um, we are now, we, I also am a senior lecturer for a university MSc course in Health Incident and Command. We are now making this particular MSc de rigueur for certain managers. You're going to have to do it. If you want to take on that role, off you go and do this MSc so that you really understand, but test my leadership in your environment. If I'm, if I'm sent to your hospital, can I, can I come up with the goods for you? We've mentioned staff welfare. There is a macho couch in the EMS system. 
However, we do lose every incident. We lose two or three members of staff. And it's not always the junior members. It's other staff which just thought, I can't come anymore. I'm gone. We have a peer, we have a peer support system. We have our own um, occupational health and counselling. I know how many people access counselling, but I don't know who. We've been very careful with our staff to say this is confidential. Unless, and if you really want to talk to me about it or whatever, then please do come and talk to me. But if you access a counsellor in the LAS, uh, I won't know who you are. I think that is, that is quite imp one important aspect. Resilience. Um, I didn't go home for f nearly four days. Uh, um, my wife, bless her, is used to this. Um, but again, I do, I, you do need to take on board the welfare of your staff and the wealth of your staff's families. The wife, the husband, the son, the daughter. I'm eternally grateful to my, my wife, bless her, for the support she gives me. And I just think sometimes we, we forget these good people at our peril, because uh, they are important to our staff and your staff. We were at threat level critical for months and months, and we, we had teams stood up for 24-7 um, for nearly four months. That's a burden, A, on your resources, but also on your mental, just a strain. Of, is this going to happen again? Because we had no idea, was this the prelude to a, a, a much bigger bombing campaign? Media management, now that I'm, I'm really sorry, <laughs> my apologies. I'm not going to castigate the media anymore. <laughs> well, not a bit. But just bear in mind, they have incredible response times, much better than ours sometimes. <laughs> They, they, they use, in London, they use motorbikes. They're there on scene at the Paddington train crash and fire. They were there, ready to interview me as I turned up. Uh, bloody hell. Um, now, we, we train certain managers to, in, to deal with the press. I sympathise greatly with John's view about the paramedic who was interviewed about the trial decisions. Um, the gentleman you're looking at on the screens here, the chap on the far right, uh, Ian Perkins, is a, cycle para is a motorbike paramedic. But we have given him very, very specific uh, media training. And he has agreed, he agreed to, 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 to be interviewed. The colleague on the far left of the screen, as you, uh, sorry, on the left as you look at it, is the gentleman who was working with me at Russell Square. And the chap in the middle was our assistant chief of operations. We always keep at least two very senior managers back in dress uniform to put in front of a, a camera. The cameras want, at, at one particular incident, the cameras wanted to see me this was from the Paddington train crash. I'd just come back from dealing with 32 people killed in a train crash to be met by um, a reporter, I won't mention which, which network, um, to say, can I take a photo of you, please, in your, in your jacket? It was covered in blood, soot. No, I said, no, I'm sorry, you can't. Give me five minutes, though. Please, go have a cup of tea. Give me five minutes. I'll come back down. I'll talk to you. That gave me some space to think, right, OK, fine. What am I going to say to this chap? But also, I, got, I had to, to change. I came back down. He said, oh, Where's your bloody jacket gone? I said, uh, that's gone in the bin, mate. If you want a photograph, it's me dressed as I am now, smart. I said, please think about the families of both the dead, both the, the dead and the survivors. They don't want to see my jacket on these screens or on the newspapers with their loved one's blood on it. And I'll give him his due. He said, oh, I'd never ever thought about that. I said, well, okay, fine, not a problem. Now, how can I help you? Um, we had a, a very good discussion. And the days that follow, literally days and weeks afterwards, I was giving interviews to, to CNN, uh, Japan, all over the world. But I'm designated to do this work with some other colleagues, so it takes the heat off other people. We then had the whole thing happen again on the 21st of July. Four bombs, thankfully, the detonators went off. The detonators went off, but thankfully, they couldn't get their maths right and they'd mixed the wrong, the wrong ingredients, or the wrong quantities of ingredients. The bomb themselves didn't go off. But we were ready, and we flooded these incidents with, with, with vehicles. But I could see the look in, in, my, in my staff's faces. Oh, my God, not again. I remember I was thinking, oh, my God, not again, please, no, no, not within two weeks. I, I don't think I can take this. Um, thankfully... Um, that they, they didn't go off, thankfully. Key messages. It was the first time we'd seen suicide bombing in Western Europe. You had had the terrible events of 9-11. And I would, you know, these events we experienced in London pale into insignificance against 9-11. They just, they just don't compare. Dreadful events in, in New York. 
you do need to exercise multiple incidents on different sites to really stretch your command systems, your staff, everybody, the hospitals. Triage needs constant practicing because you are going to be questioned about this. Extensive planning is essential. Two minutes before the party is not the time to learn to dance. Exercise role, not rank, but bear in mind your higher ranked people, people like myself and above, are going to have to take on board much further education, training, etc. Communications, if they do fail, how are you going to carry on? Have a plan when the plan fails, because the communications will fail. Um, my apologies if I've run over my time, my sincere apologies. My email address is there. I appreciate I may, there may be some questions that come to mind after I've left. Please feel free to email me. My address is in the pack as well. There's a, the ISBN there for Jill's book. It makes interesting reading. If you want to look at um, the 7-7 inquiries, both the coroner's inquest and the Greater London Assembly, the URLs are there. And the URL for the single, single plan for London is also there as well. I'm often minded when I give these sorts of presentations of the words of Voltaire, who said, what well, he's a quote he's attributed to saying, on doit des égards au vivant, au mort, on ne doit que la vérité, which roughly translated means, um, you owe respect to the living, and to the dead you owe nothing but the truth. I think we've heard throughout today, I think I would like to slightly rearrange this. It is both those, the, those who have died and those who have survived who need both the truth and also the respect. And I think we've had some very honest um, sort of feelings expressed here today. I hope I've expressed respect to both those who sadly died in this incident and also to those who, 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 um, who survived as well. This is the memorial um, in Hyde Park to the 7-7 victims. Thank you very much, Nidal Zimbabwe.